All right, welcome to today's show. Today we're talking with Krista Klein, who has been a top performing mortgage broker in Vancouver for more than a decade. She is a true local, born and raised here in Vancouver, unlike me, who is an Albertan interloper. It's okay. Welcome still, to the show, Krista. Still talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> uh, first of all, I wanna know why a mortgage broker? Why did you decide to follow uh, this path for your career? Uh, you know what? It's always a funny thing. Um, I actually became a broker by accident and I was 25 years old, graduated from school, had all the student loan debt in the world. And, you know, just, you know, you're 25 out of school, can't really figure anything out. And my brother was in finance for years and he came home and said to me, you know, Krista, I think you should get your mortgage broker license. And I said, what in the world is that? Probably had some more expletives around that <laughs> fun words and I just remember him making me do it he forced me it was a lot of money it was a thousand bucks back in 2006 and it was a thousand dollars I honestly didn't particularly have and I remember when I ordered it and I said what's a thousand bucks towards my education after you know like you have to start paying back those student loans and he was right fell in love with it I started working um I had a, one of the top mortgage brokers in, I want to say Canada, um, took me under her wing and I spent three years actually doing all her, her files from start to finish. So my learning curve was just through the work, through, uh, through the roof. And uh, after I got to the point and I made the decision where I was just going to go do my own thing and I just haven't looked back. Isn't that amazing how like you always think as a kid, like, oh, I'm yeah. going to be this, this, this or that. And then all of a sudden something just lands and you're like, oh, that was a total, you know, divergent path, but you love it. And here you are. Um, yeah, it, so, it, it's hilarious. It makes no sense, right? So, <laughs> but, it's the, but that's the best way, right? Like no one had ever, like half the time people don't end up with going where they think that they thought they were going to go and they end up finding that they love it. So I think that's amazing. Yeah. You don't wake um, up in kindergarten and say you want to be a mortgage broker. No, you exactly, kindergarten right? And you want to be a great one teacher, right? So I get it. <laughs> that was my dream. I wanted to be a great one teacher. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so why would you one choose to engage with a mortgage broker over say going straight to their bank? Like what, what's the benefit of, of engaging with a broker? Um, well, one, we answer the phone. <laughs> Two. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, work it. That's just pretty good. Um, so when you work with a mortgage broker, and assuming you're working with a good mortgage broker, and and I don't like to, you know, particularly disbank because I have some really great connections with some um, mortgage specialists that are not brokers per se, but they work with the bank, and I have great relationships with them. And when it comes down to it, you want to work with someone who has your best interest at heart and is able to get your deal done. That's it. So when you work with just like RBC, you're working at BMO, you're working with Scotia, whoever it is at the branch level, you're only getting that one person's, honestly, a little bit of perspective on it. And they don't know how to do anything else outside of what they have on their sheet in front of them. Where when you work with a mortgage broker, you are getting access to one, all the lenders I have access to, um, lenders that you've never heard of. And again, with my relationships at branch with branch people, sometimes I even just kind of like put you towards them to make sure that we're able to get, you know, be successful for you in the end. Yeah, I feel like um, my, my take on a, a, using a mortgage broker, and we, we do that for our, our own personal life or yeah. you know, is, is that it, using a mortgage broker helps to have them basically do the shopping around for you and finding the best sort of um, modality of whatever the product is at whatever, whatever, yeah. wh whoever the lender happens to be. Yeah. So especially it's, it's very easy to get financing when you have great income, you're just buying one property, you have the down payment, it's no problem. Most people can just get that done. But once you get into having multiple properties, you have basement suite income, um, or especially people when they get into the point where they have over five properties, what do you do? It's incredibly more difficult to get financing. And if you're continuously having one relationship with one bank, well, you're only ever going to be with that one bank's rules. For yeah. example, um, and I can go off in a million examples. It's like, well, with this lender, I can get my client 2 million. With their lender, I can get them 1.2. Well, at the end, you choose. Yeah. Right? Like, what's important <laughs> to you? Do you yeah, want to have the extra money or do you love the, being comfortable with where you are? 
And a lot of the times the client will, you know, and I do something a little bit different. I actually do, especially when, when, when things are more complicated, I actually do live pre-approvals with my clients. So they really have an understanding of what they look like to a particular lender and what lenders are actually going to be able to help them achieve their goal. Right. No, I think that's, I think that's really powerful in, in being armed with knowledge. So, you know, exactly sure. where you stand. So you're not overreaching or you're not underreaching. Maybe you sure. thought, well, I could only go and, you know, buy something that's this much money when really I could do more or the, yeah. or the reverse. Well, it, and, that, and that's, that's exactly it is just being, you know, empowered with the information of understanding what your actual situation looks like and how we're going to be able to take what you look like and, you know, attain what your future goals are. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I, I wanted to have you on the show so we can go through yeah. some modalities around like, how do we find the, the money um, for our renovation projects? I mean, we can all dream the good dream. We want our dream house where we want our dream space. <sighs> But the reality is if we don't have the money, we can dream all we want, but it's not, just not going to happen. Like it's not going to magically happen. And all of a sudden we hear we have our finished space. So maybe start with, um, I guess, educating us on generally how, how does home equity work? And then maybe we can go into some uh, different scenarios of, of how we can arrange the financing for yeah. renovation. So there's always this, idea of what home equity is so and if you're if you're sitting in a multi-million house in Vancouver which I know a lot of people are and you happen to have you know a zillion dollars available to you in terms of what your house value is if you still want to be able to get a best rate mortgage loan you still have to qualify for it so there's kind of three different ways that when I when we look at putting together an application for someone. So and I'm going to kind of, it's okay if I go into like sub genres yeah, of this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> let's just say that you're first time home buyer and you're buying your very first condo and you want to be able to do like a quick renovation project on it. You want to update the kitchen. You want to update the floors. You want to add paint. Well, you're putting less than 20% down. So we already know that, you know, like you only have five, 10% available to you well how do we ensure that you're able to add value to your property right out of the gate the program is called purchase press improvements and most lenders do this um and what that means is so if you are buying a property for let's just we we'll call it six hundred thousand dollars seven hundred thousand dollars you're putting five ten percent down on this property and you want to do a 40,000, again, like you can correct me just, if I'm just wrong. numbers, yeah. $40,000. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It is. Yeah. I don't know how much things cost. So that's a brandy, that's brandy <laughs> stuff. And, you know, but like, let's just say it's minor. Say it's 30 to $40,000 you want to do. What the lender will do is they'll actually improve, they'll actually approve you for that $40,000 lift. Right. What the caveat is, is that you actually have to complete the work before the lender gives you the money. Uh, yes. So that's, that's a major problem, right? Yeah. So a lot of the times when we know that clients are, you know, they're getting for them pre-qualified for a mortgage loan and they, you know, they're looking at more like fixer up type properties and they're thinking to themselves, well, I do want to get into, you know, a place where I can just do a nice renovation to it. I will, and if they don't have the money available to them in cash, that's when we would go and get you qualified for a line of credit at a bank. And we would do this all before you bought the place. Right. Because the moment you start buying a place, well, things just got hard. But if you're thinking about buying a place, that's when it's, you don't own anything yet. And you know, you have your income to be able to service that particular line of credit. We would look at getting you a line of credit. That's good. Advice. And then, yeah. well, right. Like it's easier to get access to credit when you don't owe a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> I know it's, it's counterintuitive, but yes, yeah, yes, absolutely. I know, I know. And, and especially, and what's interesting about this particular program, well, not really interesting is that um, they will, when you, when they price out everything, uh, they usually will just accept a contractor's quote. And then sometimes there are the do it yourself people and that person wants to go to Home Depot and they want to price out all of their own stuff. To me, that sounds like a horror story. <laughs> but 
<laughs> well, to each their own, but it, yeah. well, I think it yeah. would depend on what, what the work is that they're planning on doing. If it's oh, just oh, that, you know, a new yeah. board or painting or whatever, then yeah. yeah, go fill your boots. But if you're yeah. going to do, you know, something that's a little bit more significant, then you might be, yeah. might be a good idea to have a, a contractor oh, uh, take, take a, a one, a one run look at it at least. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Right. So they'll even accept again, like if you're doing it your own quote, they'll accept your own quote. Okay. And when it comes to being able to confirm that you've done the work at the very end, the lender will get a updated appraisal to confirm everything that you've done on this sheet is done. Right. Okay. At that point, they will give you back. The, they'll give you the money, which then you can go and just, you know, pay off your line of credit. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. And then, of course, you're increasing your credit rating because now you've borrowed and you've paid. Um, yeah. Well, or, well, or just at least just bolstered it. So like you. you yeah. Done what you said you were going to do. Yeah, like you've gotten a lot of credit, like, and usually a lot of people are buying property with their spouses, so you can just go get two separate line of credits, and at least then you're not having each one on, you know, like you're not just carrying a 40 grand line of credit, it's 20 and 20. Yeah. Surprisingly enough, it's still easier to get that than like 140. Yeah. I know. Anyway. Okay, so we have the option of getting a mortgage plus the uh, upgraded money, yeah. but you have to like prove that you've done the work. Yeah. So that's one, one option for say a new home buyer. Yeah. And then when you get into say, if you are currently own your home, this is when there's some more interesting options for you. And in these two scenarios, like we're making the assumption that you're qualifying with a major bank lender. Right. So if you're sitting in a house and you have a lot of equity and you're pull, and you're thinking to yourself, I want to pull out 300, $400,000 and you already have an existing mortgage on the property the best bet is literally just get a line of credit. So you have either you can just try to get a, and it's not, when people talk about this home equity line of credits, um, there's a big um, misconception out there that it's not a mortgage. It's a mortgage. It's just, it's revanceable. And what that means is, is that, say you got access to $300,000. When it's at $0, you're not paying any interest on it. When you start to utilize this line, you're paying interest on it, but then you can pay it back down to zero. Right. So depending on um, like how big the renovation is or how small the renovation is, if you have enough equity in your property, you can qualify for that. The simplest route is just either increase your mortgage or get a line of credit. And when we start looking at what the price differences are between both, a line of credits usually run at prime plus a half. So that's 2.95%. And then mortgage rates are whatever the best mortgage rates are at the time. Right. So if you're thinking about doing a build in a year, well, then it might make sense to get a line of credit that you're not paying interest on it. If you're thinking about doing renovations in the next month and you know what your exact timeline is and you're super organized to do it, it might just make sense just to get a mortgage. Right. So when you have a, an LOC or a HELOC, yeah. two kind of interchangeable terms as far as yeah. I understand it. Yeah. You use the money, you are obligated to pay interest only yeah. for, mm -hmm. forever, um, yeah. as far as I understand. But, um, and that's basically like, there is no term length. It's not like a 25 year term or a 20 year term as a mortgage no. would be. No. So it's just, yeah. so it, it always gets renegotiated at the end of your term anyways. Mm -hmm. So if you had your existing mortgage and you added on a line of credit, a lot of lenders at the end of your next mortgage term, they would just kind of assume that line of credit's renewing at the same time. Right. It's cool. kind of like just part of the overall package. Yeah. Um, one thing that's neat about a line of credit is a lot of lenders will allow you to actually portion them off and so pretty much close them. So let's just say you got a line up for 300 for the, for the renovation and you've utilized a hundred and rates are good and it makes sense to you. And you decided to just take that hundred thousand dollars and make it a regular variable rate mortgage. That's when you would have the 30 year amortization and make that a regular payment. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So you get start down the path, you conclude, you know exactly how much you can then. Yeah transition that to you know a, a product that does have an amortization yeah and what right now what hundred thousand dollars is this like what <laughs> like three or hundred dollars a month or something like 
Like, uh, it's, math, right? it's it's pretty cheap. Yeah, it's right right now money is cheap. Obviously, money, yeah. So right now, like some of the fixed rates have gone up. Uh, there is a a little bit of a rush in the bond market, but variable rate is still insanely cheap. And the government came back. And again, I'm not the government, so don't quote me. But this is what everybody's saying. Um, government's not going to be moving their rates for a couple of years, and who knows how fast the, the economy is going to recover. Like we don't really have any of those answers, but in, you know, looking at, you know, historic situations, let's just say they did start to increase rates in two years. They're not going to increase it by 2% in six months. It's going to be a very slow rise. Yeah. I mean, they don't want to shock, shock the system. Into they, they can't. They can. right? Yeah. Well, I can't say they can't, of course they can, but they would be stupid of them to do that. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so what, what, what else would sort of come to mind um, as far as a, a scenario or a situation that you've sort of come up uh, with somebody oh. else in, in the past? Um, I've done actually quite a few of these purchase plus improvements. I think, um, you know, talking about just having a lot of equity in your property, a good question is, what do you do when you don't have a lot of equity in your property, but you want to do the renovation? Right. So you're not sitting on, you know, a you know, dollars worth of house. Killian dollars. You're just not, but you can qualify for the mortgage loan. That's when it's called instead of purchase plus improvements, it's refinance and, and improvements. Okay. And what that means is say, you know, you have your condo or your house and you want to be able to do, you know, floors, kitchen. And what they'll do is they'll actually base the value of what they're lending off of the future value of the property. Right. So they do some back numbers from there. And again, they will all, when you do a refinance plus improvements, the rule of thumb is, um, again, they're like when you refinance a property in general, you can always just take it up to 80% of the value of the property. Okay, that's a good. Number. So they might they might just give you up to the eighty percent of the existing value, and that difference between the existing value and future value, much like the purchase plus improvements program, you're going to have to ask for it. Like they're going to give it to you at the end of right uh, of the deal. So you're still going to have to be able to show that you can finance the particular renovations. And again, that's where having the other types of line of credits come in handy. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, yeah. I think that's a, a great, you know, like I didn't know about that type of scenario with, with our first house. Yeah. We just like, we earned and then we renovated and then we earned and then we renovated. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like we kind of did it that way. Um, and I think it, it would have been very helpful <laughs> for us to have maybe understood the modality around that. I mean, mind you, this was like 20 something years ago. It was our first house. So maybe it wasn't quite as common yeah. back then as it might be now, but um I think as a from a first time home buyer who does want to add value to their place, um, I think it's definitely something that you can keep in mind. And I and I love the idea of getting that LOC before you actually get your mortgage in place. It's a secret. I oh, it's out now. It's out now. We put it out of the bag. Yeah, it's a secret. It's uh, it's one of those things again where it's and it's gonna sound silly. But my experience applying for an unsecured line of credit, it's more difficult. My experience is harder to get than getting a mortgage. Makes no sense. Well, I, I, have some, I have some other secrets around that, but I'm not going to share this one here. Uh, yeah. Um, would that be because that LOC isn't like backed by an asset? Exactly. Primarily? It's not secured. Or a house that's always secured. All right. All right. So, you know, for those people who maybe want to do some real estate investing and still improve, you know, add, add value to the property, they already have their existing uh, place, whether it's a, a home or a condo. Yeah. Um, and they get into, like you mentioned at the top of the show, like you can get more mortgages up till a certain point and then it becomes a lot more difficult. So say, Say someone had their primary uh, residence and now they want to buy a secondary property and they want to do some improvements. So what would sort of some of the, the, th the tips around that be? So it's the same type of thing. So when you buy the secondary property, and again, it all comes down to how much cash you have, right? Mm -hmm. So are refinancing your primary residence 
up to 80% taking that money out, using that money to be able to have part of your down payment and then have cash to do the purchase plus improvements? Or do we only have so much money going in as for down payment and then we have a little bit of cash and then we're using those purchase plus improvements programs to be able to finance? Yeah, and generally for a non-primary residents, I mean, Mm -hmm. I know you're not a mortgage broker, but you deal with this whole transaction a fair bit the down payment amount needs to be higher than our primary residence or is it? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. So there's a lot of misconceptions about insured financing. So insured financing is you've had, um, do you have less than 20% down? Uh, the rule of thumb is property values have to be less than a million dollars. That was capped a very long time ago. I forget what particular year. And there's a misconception that you have to be a first time home buyer to be able to buy a property with less than 20% down. That's not true. Okay. So if you're buying a secondary home or, you know, like you're buying a cottage or you're buying a cabin, you're buying, um, you know, a property for family to stay in because they're going to school somewhere. You, as long as you qualify, you can purchase that secondary home or cottage with 5% down. Really? Yep. Uh- that's interesting. You're so, like, excuse me? <laughs> I said, pardon? Um, hmm. uh, and then, of course, the same type of uh, scenario would maybe apply yeah. to when you're trying to improve that property. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's for a kid to go to school somewhere or yeah. you want to uh, invest in the real estate market and then have a tenant, for instance. Yeah. Um, and, but you want to do a bit of a, a value add to it before you rent it out or what have you. Yeah. You'd still need to look at ways to finance that particular yeah, thing you can it. still you can still finance it for a secondary home okay yeah cool. so that's just really 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 good to know it is good to know like yeah. I didn't know that I thought I was like I thought you were going to be having to look at putting more of a down payment down because it isn't your primary residence no nope. so if you did have 20 percent down um rule of thumb like secondary homes even though they're not your primary residence they kind of follow the same rules as a family a, fi- a primary residence you're going to get the same rates as a primary residence. Nice. So it's not like it's, it's, it's a win-win. So if you're having 20% down on a secondary home or you have less than 20% down, so you're putting five or, five or 10%, you're just either following the insured guidelines or you're following the conventional guidelines. Right. But you can do it. Right. Rental right. properties is different. Rental properties, you have to have 20% down. Okay. So that's a good yeah. differentiation to make. Yeah. So yeah. It's like it says, for instance, say it was me and I was going to have my kid go to uni, uni somewhere and we wanted to buy a, like a two bedroom, two bathroom place so that we have our kid in one room and a rental part yeah. in that room, but it's still owned by us. That would yeah. be one scenario. But if we were going to buy something and rent it out entirely onto its own thing, that's a rental without any family being in it, that would be something different. Yeah, that's completely different. Okay, cool. um, so any, any other tidbits of wisdom that... Uh, yeah, so... There's, yeah, another thing we should talk about because the programs that we've talked about have all been just one draw, mm-hmm. one single draw. Right. So say you want to do like a pretty large renovation and, you know, like a million dollar renovation or okay. like you're building a house, yeah. or yeah. building yeah. some of the house. There are other programs out there where it's called construction financing and construction financing is different than purchase plus improvements. It's different than the renovation plus improvements. This is where you're actually are given draws. Right. So you have to, you have to complete a certain percentage of the work and they pay you back. So So, usually those are more like larger scope projects, mm -hmm. but then if you only have so much working capital, you're able to get your working capital moving to the different stages. And then how, how do they verify that you've, you've got substantial completion to that, that progression point and and so Yeah. So a lot of the, like the, bank lending are a little bit more conservative on that but then when we get into different types like different lenders out there credit unions are still offering best rates some even have rules where you don't have to get up to certain points they'll part of their package to be like i'll give you three draws anything else we're going to charge you 150 bucks a draw or 200 bucks a draw right so if you have less working capital then that's perfect for you because then you're just like okay 100 grand 100 grand 100 grand 100 grand right and then you're only really being charged interest on the money that you yeah. take from, from exactly. that, that point forward, not the whole amount at yeah. the very beginning. Yeah. That's a great and, tip too. Yeah. And that's just something, again, like when you're looking at pulling, 
you know, again, the benefit of having a line of credit, you can kind of view the draw as a line of credit, but you just don't have control over the line of the credit. You have to go ask to get the money back. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah don't, that's, that's a good piece of information for people who do want to do a larger reno. Like um, maybe they have, uh, they're going to add on the top layer of their, ho- their home yeah. or they're going to, you know, do something completely on the first floor and it's going to be kitchen, a couple bathrooms, flooring throughout, painting throughout. Yeah. And it's going to, you know, add up to a, a fair amount of money and, you know, how, how do you do that? So that, that that's really and, good. Um, and the last thing you ever want to do when you're doing a purchase plus improvements or refinance is that when you, especially when you get into the refinance plus improvements and you're doing that larger single draw, the lenders will ask to see if you have access to the money to do that. Because part of that program is that they don't do multiple draws. They do one. And they don't want to be stuck in a situation <laughs> where you're 50% complete, you run out of money. What do you do now? Right. Right. Like, and that happens. I, I feel like not to speak, but I've seen that too many times where um, you said, there's a builder, they've just gone over budget. And, you know, like they've had their first mortgage, second mortgage, and they're at the point where they're going, I need to complete this build. Where do I go? Yeah. And that's a different conversation. That is hard money conversation. <laughs> but I got a solution for you. Okay. Well, what, what would be the solution? <laughs> so when, when you private, get into private that, lending. 100% private lending, you got to have someone willing to pretty much take the risk of you not completing that build. Yeah. Well, and then of course the interest rate on it's, it's more expensive for yeah, sure. Like it's, it's kind of like that, the rule that, you know, he, he who has the gold makes the rules. Oh, hundred percent. They can almost charge whatever they want and how many ever fees they want to charge for yeah. Yeah. So, pushing and all kinds of things, right? Yeah. You would always just make sure that you got the best possible, like me, I always make sure the client gets the best possible one. But when you get into that multi-layer mortgage world. So when I'm talking, you got your first mortgage, your second mortgage, your third mortgage, and then you're not going, going for your fourth mortgage and then your fifth mortgage. Like, you have no control at that point. It's like, you just go, thank you. Yeah, please, please. <laughs> I'm begging for some more money. And then, well, you know, yeah. And, and then that, you have to work till you're 90 to pay it all off. Right? Yeah. Well, most of that time is just like, you know, like either we have that takeout loans when you start getting into the hard money. So that's a really good kind of leeway into the whole, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard really great jingles on the radio being like, if you own a home, yada, yeah, yada, yeah. Yada. I'm not going to go into details of all those beautiful names. A lot of people take those loans without even understanding. Yes, it's it's private money. They don't get it. They don't understand it's expensive. And they don't understand there's actually better private money out there. Right? Like it all, all comes down to marketing and advertising, I suppose. Absolutely, right? I, I feel like I can get a loan through them too. <laughs> and <laughs> I know, but it's just like, it's just one of those things, right? And I see a lot of people get kind of caught out on in that situation where they think that's the only solution. And then I finally go and I talk to them being like, well, actually there's 500 solutions for you. People would actually love to lend you money for a nice percentage. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I guess the, the moral of the story here all the way through is that really homeowners or new or people who want to become homeowners really should be connecting with a mortgage broker such as yourself to look and and investigate all of the options that are available to them based on the specific circumstance absolutely and that they may be pleasantly surprised at what they can actually do or achieve or how much money they they thought they could get and they can actually get more or maybe let's be realistic or maybe hey let's wait a year and build up a little bit more of this or do a little bit more of that and then go ahead and, and look really look for something to purchase or to improve or whatever and and that's that's really that's really it's exactly what i do and it's interesting sometimes where i'll especially and this is getting to off topic in terms of people that are business for self or like they just have these um it's not just so simple to be able to give them a really best rate mortgage. And a lot of the times when you start talking with somebody is just setting them up for success. This is what we have to do to be able to achieve your goal in two years. Yeah. I mean, we, with our clients, we usually talk to them about what their longer range plans are yeah. and where are we going. And I, you, you cannot get a, a, around the value of good planning. Absolutely. 
if you have good planning, both whether it's actually executing your renovation or finding the money yeah. or whatever else it is in your life, if you've got a good plan that is based on really real, realistic sort of parameters and that, you know, you've done your research and you're happy with the, um, the plan or, or the plan of attack that you're going to, that path you're going to go down. I think that's by far is like the best piece of advice I could ever give anybody is just do your homework, get a plan, understand what you're doing, and then you can go ahead and execute with peace of mind. The best part too is when someone actually listens to you and does it. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> and it's like, wow, let me help you get into your house. I'm so yeah. pleasantly surprised that you took all of my advice. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, sometimes it's like, you can only lead a horse to water. Yeah. And, and other times they actually do drink what, you know, what you're serving. They're drinking the Kool-Aid that you're, that you're providing to them. Um, I guess, is there anything else? I mean, I keep on asking, is there anything else? And you keep on coming up with some really amazing things, but I feel like we've talked about the new homeowner thing and how we can improve that, where we've been at if we're um, someone who's going to do a, a moderate renovation with their, with their home and someone who's going to do a bigger project and they need a construction loan um sort of those are the three tiers that sort of came to mind for me is there anything sort of outside um, those those lines there um there's I always just tell people there's always a way to to get money and sometimes when you especially when you get into the more larger construction projects when you're getting to the multi draws um and this is going to sound funny sometimes the expensive money makes the most sense <laughs> it does and it comes down to time how fast they can pull those draws but it also comes down to the person building it has to be moving at a very steady pace yeah yeah when you get into more like uh private financing or, or you know pretty much companies that really specialize in construction so they're going to charge construction general costs a bit more and you just have such ease. You're never going to be stuck in a situation where you haven't made a lockup. Mm, yeah. And how are you going to get the lockup? Well, you're short a couple hundred thousand dollars because you've gone over budget. They will just simply give you the draws. Yeah. And there's something, there's something for kind of just, you know, it's just, it's a less painful experience. Yes. It's costing you a few points more, but at the same time, it's just. Well, it's that peace of mind factor that you're simpler to deal with hanging out to dry yeah totally <laughs> or, or you won't have anywhere to hang your laundry to dry out so yeah no <laughs> definitely your, your not. second story isn't built yet or whatever yeah you don't have a roof on there's no windows right all right well I feel like you know we've you've gone through a whole bunch of scenarios and you've given some really amazing um tips and some of the things I didn't know um so it's been a, a little bit of an education for me as well so thank you for that you're welcome um I I feel like I want to just sort of leave it there for now. I mean, the, the general idea would be just contact your mortgage broker um, and really have that initial discussion. And if someone wanted to get in touch with you, what would be the best way for them to do that, Krista? Um, you can text me, you can email me, you can, ah, let's just do it to that because like I get confused when people are WhatsApping me and DMing me oh, on yeah, Instagram yeah. and Facebook. It just gets too much. I'm like, where did this so, person uh, even talk maybe to Maybe just... Uh, Shout out what your email address is and not, not your phone number though. Like oh, that. sure. It's uh, Krista <laughs> at KristaKleinMortgages.ca. Nice. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. Perfect. Perfect. Now, before we wrap up, I do want to ask you a couple of fun questions. Sure. And go for it. Everybody knows, Krista doesn't know what the, the questions were going to be. And um, the first one is, what would you like to change or renovate in your own home or your own property? What would be the number one thing you'd like to renovate? If, if money wasn't well just in general what would be an the issue <laughs> oh god this current place I'm in which you have been in I would like one of those separation walls like just kind of like enclose my home office space a bit better right and then the second one I have um is are you handy and if so what's your favorite tool and if you're not handy what tool do you think would be the most fun to use? I'm actually pretty handy. Nice. Rule, rule That's why thumb. I like you so much. <laughs> rule, th rule of thumb. You got to be at least with, with, in a relationship choosing, someone in the relationship has to be able to put together Ikea furniture. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so that is me. Is your favorite tool the Allen key then? Is no, that, no, that no. I do have like 50, hundred of them. Like I got so many Allen keys. I know. It's brutal. Um, you're going to laugh. I probably use a uh, needle nose pliers the most. <laughs> They're very handy. They're super handy. They are. That's great. Yeah. But I love that you know what they are because not everybody does. You know, I have, I have a go hole too. Like it's all like random tools in a drawer, but I have a lot of tools. I, my, my dad had a tool, tools section growing up. So we, I spent a lot of time in my youth cutting his nails in half and wrecking his wood. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> It was fun. The hacksaw, man. We had a great time hacking away his nails. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, again, it's been great having you on the show today. And for those listening, I hope you found some valuable insight on um, mortgage strategies that might work for you to help fund your next renovation. And I will say ciao for now. <laughs>